Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Open Up the Workforce, where we speak with executives and leaders driving diversity, equity, and inclusion in the future of work and really all places and culture. I'm very excited to be joined today by Lewis Stewart, who is the head of strategic initiatives for NVIDIA's global developer ecosystem. Mr. Stewart has served over 13 years in the public sector, also in the university setting, and 19 years in the private sector, and has some exciting international experiences like playing professional basketball in Peru and Belgium. Lewis, welcome to our show. Would you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your career story? Yeah, thanks for having me. This is this is an exciting opportunity to to work with you on this. And you kind of hit all the parts in the lead up, but to, to expand a little bit on kind of my my career story, the reality is I'm a living, breathing example of preparation meeting opportunity. I fell into a, a government job thanks to an ad on Craigslist that landed me a, a job working as a statewide IT director for a political campaign which then led into my 13-year public service career. And they took a shot on me because I had the the technical skills to manage the network. I had the the know-how to to manage a telecom network. And I just happened to be a studio art major so I can help them with their their marketing campaigns. So I was not your traditional hire for a, a political campaign. And each step of my career from that day forward, I just kept picking up little tidbits of knowledge like how money flowed from the federal government to the states, down to the cities, how communities get funding and which ones don't, who gets exposed to opportunities and the infrastructure that's there to enable them or not. These learnings led me from the DMV here in the state state of California to the state census effort back in 2009-2010 to being the, the first chief innovation officer within the state and at the city of Sacramento. And each step of the way, gather these, these puzzle pieces and put me on the track that I'm on today, helping underrepresented communities gain access and opportunity to the technologies we advance for NVIDIA. That's amazing. And I feel like I've been impacted by so much of your work. We just did our census report and spent a lot of time actually on that process. So how cool and awesome work that you've done as the first chief innovation officer as someone in the startup realm in California. Uh, definitely reaping some of the benefits of the impact and the work that you've had. I would love to circle back and dive a little bit deeper into some of the challenges you spoke about when we think about promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in the tech industry. How have you maybe, what challenges have you seen and how are you working to address them today? Yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to be super clear, right? This isn't a new challenge for the tech industry. And I'm just simply one of the newest voices in the space, trying to create access and opportunity for underrepresented people globally. My, my role here at NVIDIA is, is to help the company diversify its developer pipeline. Here in the U.S., that's going to be with minority-serving institutions like HBCUs, Hispanic-serving institutions, indigenous colleges, communities of learning, and, and stuff like that. But then overseas, uh, it's looking at underrepresented populations that are trying to, to level up in their communities so that they can actually compete as well. So I'll say there's there's really several key challenges that keep coming up, whether it was in government or now in tech. Lack of visibility that people have into various communities. Lack of willingness to engage with communities. The perception that there is no talent out there in certain communities. And really the willingness to, 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 to put in the work and the investment to build a pipeline, make a connection, give the mentorship that, that's needed to, to help communities level up, whatever the community is. And ultimately this, this part I, I really learned during my census time was it comes down to trust building. If you go into a community and you make promises that you don't deliver on, it, it, it doesn't ever work. Right. So it, it's nice to, to come to the rescue and give money. But if the money actually doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or you don't have the relationships that you actually need to have or an understanding, it it doesn't do anybody any good. So I think that some people can maybe kind of retract that a little, but it doesn't do all the good that that's possible. Yes. And it's not sustainable, right? We see that happen where you see all of a sudden there's a big cash influx and great PR release, but then you're like, what's happening five or 10 years out? How are we measuring the impact? How are we continuing to invest? So 
I appreciate you for sharing that. And I couldn't agree more, to be honest. When we were excited to bring you on this podcast, we noticed that you do have a, a background working in, with, in the academic sector in universities. And speaking of trust building, I'd be curious to get your perspective on how maybe an employer could work with the university a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. So with the university, you know, a lot of employers have to understand that the university's, uh, their biggest asset is their students and their professors. Right? So increasing loads on, on professors make it so that they can't engage necessarily like they should. Getting access to the students, that's a lot of times where the money comes in. So, so employers need to, need to understand the inner workings of the university, but then also come to the university with how it's going to help solve some of the, the inherent challenges that universities have. So that's uh, recruitment of new talent, whether that be students or professors. That's going to be enabling technology. So how does how's enabling technologies? So how do you know these professors that have these crazy workloads learn and then teach the students these new technologies. So it, it really needs to be a partnership mindset when it comes to, to universities and, and a problem-solving mindset as well. You can't just come to them and drop technology on them and say, teach this and expect folks to be trained uh, on the other side. Of it. That, that's, that's not sustainable either. That's so true. I was speaking with a, another senior leader talking about the academic space and how it's also important to have professors who are diverse and resemble because it is when you are learning that process, you it's a trusting process. You want to see yourself and potentially learn from a leader who looks like you to see yourself in the field long term. So I, I couldn't agree more with that aspect. And at NVIDIA, we've noticed that you've made incredible strides as a company, that you've doubled the representation of Black and African-American employees in your workforce since 2020. And women continue to be promoted at approximately equal rate as men in your company. Can you talk a little bit about some of the strategic programs and initiatives that NVIDIA has implemented to support underrepresented groups in tech? Yeah, absolutely. So internally, we, we have a lot of programs and, and I would defer that part of my, my conversation to, to my colleagues that actually focus in, in our professionals in the DIB space. What I can actually talk to you about is, is what I do in my role to help to help connect NVIDIA, NVIDIA's technology to underrepresented groups out there. Uh, so as I mentioned, I work, I interface with minority serving institutions, I interface with women-led organizations and, and various other communities of learning out there that, that are really specific, whether it be women in AI and robotics or particular data science group or groups like I. There, there's a lot of groups out there, I'll just say that. And, uh, you know, what we've done is there's several things over the last couple of years of me being here. And, and that's like with Black Women in AI, we've developed a cohort style engagement where we actually bring members of Black Women in AI into a cohort style learning for eight to 10 weeks with our engineers, with our marketing team, with our HR team, so that they can actually get insight into the inner workings of, of NVIDIA but also learn something along the way. So, so this new cohort with them you know, is all about product development. What's the product development life cycle? So they've talked everything from ethical AI to developing IP and, and, and patenting it. Now they're in that computer vision segment of the cohort, and then they'll go on to tech sales and, and marketing and, and that kind of stuff. And creating those kind of intimate engagements is crucial. We've also done the, the lighter touch stuff, but it's still impactful. And that's like partnering with HBCU and HSI Battle of the Brains, uh, where they have a, a, a group of very talented students competing at South by Southwest. And for us, it was getting engaged with them was as simple as giving them one of the latest graphics cards as, as one of the prizes. But then it starts to form a bond so that it's not necessarily just a transactional piece. But we also now get to see the talent that, that's kind of building there. So for us, it also helps our recruiting by flight, right? So if we have more visibility into whether it be students, transitioning workers, folks that are, are mid-career trying to do stuff, we now are engaging with them in a, in a more intimate, personal way where we can actually learn 
do they actually fit the culture of NVIDIA? And that transitions now into uh, just simply opening up our, our GTC conference so that more people can participate by giving away Deep Learning Institute workshop seats so they can actually get hands-on training in some of our latest technologies. And also doing dedicated talks, which have proven really popular around how to get started in the world of AI. So it really just goes back to trust building. And I think for anybody out there, it's, it's about trying to meet the, le- the learners where they are. Thank you for sharing more about that work. And that was one reason we're very excited to connect with you, especially outside the scope of HR. How do we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and really access, right? I think it's really holistic, this approach. And I love the example that you shared about that cohort program that you designed. We are such big believers in those types of initiatives, but they take a ton of work to design, <laughs> to implement, and to like really see results immediately. Sometimes the results are not right away. And it's difficult sometimes to continue to sustain that buy-in. How do you think about measuring the impact and how do you continue to sustain buy-in for that program? Uh, yeah. So that's a fantastic question because that that's actually a current challenge that we're facing. We're in cohort two, with, but from all indications, it's not sustainable as a way to grow engagement, just like you said, because I have no less than six organizations hitting me up right now because they've been watching either on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on whatever the work that we're doing with, with that particular organizations and they're, they're wanting in. And so while we have a great spirit of, of volunteerism at the company, it's, it's, it's not the easiest to, to get folks to dedicate four to eight hours, which is an hour and a week. To, to interface with with what in essence is a small number of people. So we have to figure out on our side, how do we pre-record content so that people have a way to get in and, and maybe look at some stuff in the first place before deciding, okay, now you're ready for a cohort of learning, right? What can we do this pre-work? What can we do this post-work? How do we make sure that people are actually ready for what's going to be taught? So, for instance, if, if folks are coming in that are really new to AI, they may not have a background in Python. So, we develop partnerships with our learning and development team so that some of these groups can actually use our Coursera credits to go learn Python and then come into our Deep Learning Institute platform so they can actually scale up as they're learning through the cohort. But again, it's, it's, it, it's a big challenge, but, you know, the, but people see how grateful the organizations are. People see growth from the, the people that participate in this, and that continues to, to get by. Now we just have to truly figure out how to scale because I think we have a lot of, a lot of good to offer, and we just, need, we just need the right partners out there to be creative with us so that we can continue to reach the masses and kind of Yes. And I think that's honestly why we exist at Simba. So I think there could be another follow-up conversation, but we really do focus on that area because how do we make this scalable? How do we enable teams to have the resources to do this? And you said something that kind of interested me. You said volunteer. How do we get someone to volunteer four to eight hours? And some of the research and work that we've done has actually shown that people who participate in these programs um, have a higher propensity to increase retention, right? People feel like invested in program, they feel like they're giving back. And it really does boost their experience. It also has potential to improve their ability to be a manager. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to get your perspective on on that. Yeah. So it's interesting because the the first time I think, um, and still just just talking about Black Women AI, the first time I think some some folks in the company took a flyer on us, you know, the random kind of reach out, hey, doing this thing with Black Women AI, need some volunteers, come talk about X and Y. And I was actually, to, to my surprise, next thing I know, I had 20 people saying, hey, we'll come help. We, we want to do this stuff. We weren't ready for 20 people <laughs> just because it was the first time. But the second time around, more targeted in the ask, right? Because the first time, the first cohort was really just around data science and computer vision. But out of that first cohort, they developed a, a concept of a product. Okay, well, now if we're going to continue this partnership with the organization, Let's actually take that product and see if we can actually make it become a reality for the next three, five years of the partnership. And so once, once with the organization, we establish a way to move forward. 
And that's what we pitch to, to the NVIDIA employees, that they're actually helping this happen. It, it's a, a completely different response that we get because now it's super targeted. Uh, it's actually less time that they that they have to volunteer. But then the other part of it is, yes, NVIDIA has a great spirit of volunteerism. We actually have an NVIDIA foundation that, that matches your donations that, that NVIDIA employees make or they give credit for time, which equals a donation to the cause of their choice. And so with the partnership with the NVIDIA Foundation, anybody that volunteers for any of these efforts that I have, then they actually get credit through the NVIDIA Foundation where a donation goes to, to their, their cause of their choice. So it increases the, the level of, of participation and, and just wanting to help. That's brilliant. And I think that it, the testament to your culture when you say that 20 people showed up right away. So it's, that's amazing to see. And hopefully this program continues to scale and grow, and especially because you've sent out the right incentives. It encourages that. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. But it, it's awesome to hear about. And would love to hear some of your experience driving innovation and strategic efforts across your different roles. What are you excited about when we think about what's next in the world of work and innovations that you've been following trends on? Yeah, so it's interesting because now the world I live in is the world of AI, right? Before, when I was with the, the city and with the state, I had visibility into a whole bunch of different possibilities. But arriving at NVIDIA, I realized that NVIDIA actually is in all the different worlds that I was talking about, but just behind the scenes, right? And so if you're thinking about the world of AI specifically, with the speed at which AI is changing the landscape, and there's an estimated 58 million AI-related jobs being created over the next, say, 10 years. We don't really know what those jobs are going to look like, so it's hard to kind of predict, And but the excitement's there, but you, know, you also have to acknowledge people's fears. And it goes back to the trust building, that goes back to the partnerships and all the other stuff, right? So when, when I think of the future, you know, I default to my former basketball days when it was all about getting ready and adapting to what's in front of you. So I think about people getting ready for what's next. And the big part of, of what we're doing here in my role at NVIDIA is making certain that we're putting the right tools together, forming the right partnerships with education partners, government at the federal, state, and local level to ensure that programs are in place and people understand how to prepare for the work, you know, for the future jobs and the future of work. And it, it so for me, it's, it's now getting excited about the, the art of what's possible and designing that with people. And that's where the, the, the strategic mindset comes in, right? Because you have to, well, you don't have to. I, I just start from a place of yes. So if people come to me with a question or an opportunity, okay, yes. Until I absolutely have no way to do it is, is when I when I run into no. But you know, if you remember earlier, I talked about puzzle pieces. Everything is a puzzle piece. So you just got to stash it away until you find the right connected piece. And, and then you can help move things forward. So. It, so I'm just excited about the puzzle that's sitting in front of me and, and finding all the right pieces to hopefully help specifically underrepresented communities get connected and, and gain access to, to what's coming next. That's a, such a great mindset to have. And it's really inspiring because I don't think very many people always share that, right? It's sometimes saying yes always can be very challenging. So I appreciate that you're, you take that approach because it's not the easy approach. Yeah, um, and yeah. my, boss, founder, my boss, my boss hates it sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as a founder myself, I always, I've always asked for forgiveness, not permission. And sure. that's how we inspire innovation. That's how we inspire creativity and things to actually manifest. Otherwise, we we can't enable that in type of environment. So it's so right. important. Yeah, my, my my boss always is worried that I'm spreading myself like peanut butter. He says. So, yeah. so. <laughs> that's so funny. My mom, I remember when I was in high school, in like every single club, she was like. Practice saying no with me. We're going to say it out loud. <laughs> and I was like, no. And then, but, you know, it is it, it is important. How does this drive ahead? And how do we sustain this? And uh, asking the right questions and being curious throughout the whole process. So thank you for the work and the impact that you're having. I would love to ask a question that we ask at the end of every one of our podcasts, which is around our mission, open up the workforce. To us at Simba, that means creating a future of work that supports equitable access to jobs and wealth creation. And we'd love to get your perspective on what do you think are the next steps 
that leaders need to take in order to open up the workforce? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and for me, when I read it, it actually goes back to the future of work. And it's really about intentionally creating access and opportunity because AI and some of the tools that are being released are democratizing the technology and letting more people in. And so that's why NVIDIA and particularly me at NVIDIA are focused on getting people trained and ready so that they are AI literate, so that they are AI enabled, so that they can participate in the next economy and, and generate and be able to generate some kind of wealth. The, for This is really broader than the tech industry, because broadly speaking, employers should be thinking way more boldly. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of fear out there to step into the unknown, but it's really now about taking a chance and exploring the, those new ponds, making intentional investments of time and, and to learn about the needs that the talent in those ponds have. We've talked a little bit about getting to know professors and, and the students at the colleges. If you don't actually know what they need, or they don't know what they should be teaching, it, it doesn't do you any good. And so if you, for example, if you don't work with, with HBCUs or industry-specific communities of learning or whatever, uh, maybe you should take a look. Maybe you should take a trip out and, and meet the folks and, and understand you know, what some of the challenges are, understand why some of the students drop out after their sophomore year. And it has nothing to do with, with brain power, but it may have something to do with transportation. It may have something to do with something that's going on at home. So it's, it's so there's there's all these different obstacles that, that as industry folks, as employers, is is an additional investment that I think will help DIB causes. But for the tech industry specifically, DIB is not a department. It shouldn't be a department. It must be a culture. It's fairly straightforward because it's going to take everybody to advance technology for the technology to be advanced in the absolute right way to, to put up the guardrails. But, you know, if everybody's not at the table, you know, it, uh, we, we, we miss out a lot. You are the perfect example of that, that it's not a department, especially with the impact and the work that you're having. And it shows that employers do have a responsibility to make their way out to HBCUs and have these conversations and enable that people have the resources long-term to be a part of that workforce and really to participate. We really appreciate you so much for joining and sharing more about your work and really being a a North Star for a lot of companies and leaders who should be doing the same. Before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, no. I Look, I I am tremendously grateful for the opportunity to to spend some time with you. And I just want to let anybody know that, that wants to connect, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm always available. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louis. Yeah, thank you.